by virtue of the powers vested in me as the Chancellor of Walter Sisulu University. I declare this congregation open for the conferring of degrees and awarding of diplomas and certificates. Please be seated. Before we pray together this morning, the text is taken from 2 Kings chapter 7, verse 9. Then they said one to another, we do not well. This day is a day of good tidings, and we hold our peace. If we tarry, the morning light, some mishap or mischief will come upon us. Now therefore, come that we may go and tell the king's household. Before we pray, this is one of the powerful verses in the Bible. There is so much to glean from this verse and story. But let me give you the background of the story which is found in 2 Kings chapter 6 from verse 8 to chapter 7. The king of Syria warred against Israel and it was all because of land. The land was a bone of contention because of agricultural reasons, economical reasons, and geographical reasons. And because of the war, the people of Israel could not go out or come in. Now it came to pass after this that the king of Syria gathered all his hosts, and he went and besieged Samaria. And there was a great famine in Samaria that the people of Israel even ate asses, that was an unclean animal. Furthermore, they ate human flesh. During this time, Moses predicted that this will happen if they went into sin. Now, one day, the king of Israel was passing by upon the wall, and there cried a woman unto him, saying, Help me, Lord, O king. And he said, how can I help you if God cannot help you? And as the woman cried, he said, yesterday we planned and we killed my son and we ate the son together. And now it is the turn of this lady to kill the son, her son, and she hid her son. And when the king heard that, he knew that there was nothing he could do. But the next thing was to look for Elijah. So he sent a man to Elijah so that Elijah would be killed. Then Elijah sent a message to the king saying in chapter 7, Hear ye the word of the Lord. That says the Lord, tomorrow about this time shall a measure of, the, of flour be sold for shekel and two measures of belly for a shekel in the gate of Samaria. Then a lord on whose land the king leaned answered the man of God and said, Behold, if the Lord will make windows in heaven, might this thing be? And he said, Behold, you shall see it with your eyes, but will not eat thereof. And there were four lepers that were sitting at the gates. And they said one to another, Why do we sit here until we die? If we say we will enter into the city, then the famine is in the city. Now therefore come and let us go. Whether we die, if we sit here, we will die. If we go, we will die. So what is the best thing to do? Let's proceed into the enemy's camp. And as they made an effort, God allowed tender and lightning to happen in the camp of the enemy. So they fled. So these lepers went and ate and drank and enjoyed themselves. And all of a sudden, what they said to one another, we do not well. Yes, it is good for us. Look at the enjoyment, look at the meal, we look at the drink, but all is not well. We have a lot of people that are beyond the gate. If we stay here with our booty and with our enjoyment and with, the, with all that we have, 
The whole nation is at stake. So they decided, let us go and let them hear the good news. Listen, there is change that happens to us. And there is a type of change that happens around us. And there is a type of change that happens within us. But listen, this morning, there is a change that we have to initiate. Something created, altered by plans, we have implemented in order to move from the present to the preferred future. Change transport the present into a future that demands a response. The ongoing dynamics of change is one of the most important factors of human, of human life. We need to learn to oversee a change before you become a victim of change. Initiate it before you, you, you are left behind. There are times you have to initiate change. Nothing on earth is as permanent as change. Change is continual. Everything changes. Your knowledge will change. Your interests will change. Your values will change. Your priorities will change. Your body will change. Your family relationship network will change. Your marriage will change. I mean the dynamics of your marriage. I don't mean divorcing and remarrying or marrying a man and a man or all that. But I mean the dynamics of your marriage relationship will change over time. Your children will change. The image of your children as infants will change as you grow. These lepers saw the need for change and they initiated change. And today, God expects you to go and bring a change. They said, we do not well. This day is a day of good tidings. If we remain, if we remain and hold our peace, if we tarry here till morning, something mischief may come upon us. Let us go and tell our people. We are living in a time where in South Africa, more than one, one, one quarter, 25% of the people are un, unemployed. We are living in a nation where 25% of those who start primary education do not end up at the tertiary level or secondary level even. And some of you, as you look at your lives, as you look back, there are people you started together from the primary school or maybe secondary school or tertiary, and they couldn't make it. But today, we need to go back. And we need to go back and encourage them and let them know that there is more and there is more. Especially to the, uh, to the youth. You, the youth, we are living in a time where many of the young people have no direction. They have no goals in life. Even with the free education and whatever the government is pro providing for them, they seem to be so confused with the spell that has been cast upon many lives. And I pray that this morning, after your graduation, when you go back to your villages, your cities, your towns, let the young people know that we do not well. There is more, and there is more, and there will be more. Let us pray. Father, we bless you, we thank you this morning. There is nothing we can do without your Holy Spirit. Therefore, this morning, we ask the Holy Spirit to come and fill this place and permeate this place with your presence that everything we do will be to the glory of the Father. In Jesus' name, we pray. Let us sing the Lord's Prayer. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily
Ban deliver us from evil. Thank you. Esteemed Chancellor of the Walter Sisulu University, Dr. Brigalia Bam, government dignitaries from national, provincial, and local government, our guest speaker for this morning, the Honorable MEC for Economic Development, Environmental Affairs and Tourism, MEC Mkebisi Jonas. Invited guests from business sector and many communities of the Walter Sisuli University, members of the media, parents and families of the graduates here today, staff of the university, Last but not the least, uh, university graduates who will be rewarded today during this prestigious occasion in their young lives. It is my great honor and privilege to welcome all of you to this highlight on the university, the Walter Sisuli University annual calendar, the seventh graduation ceremonies of the Walter Sisuli University. A higher education qualification is the key to a brighter future and our developing nation desperately needs qualified and highly skilled graduates as we continue to build our young democracy. Walter Sisuli University carries a critical mandate in providing this golden key to a brighter future for thousands of young people in this province and beyond. The hopes and dreams of our youth, our future leaders, rely on this university to deliver on her mandate. On 18 May, the historical struggle icon whose name we are honored to bear, Walter Sisulu, have turned 100 years old. His values espoused by WSU are universal and underpin the ethos to which we aspire. Three of these values are embedded in our graduation symbolism namely excellence, wisdom, and integrity. 2012 marks a turning point in the continued development of this young Walter Sisuli University. The Department of Higher Education and Training has taken special interest in WSU, as you are aware. Minister Bladen Zamande appointed an administrator on 31st October last year to drive the process of transformation and turnaround to secure the foundation and the future of this national jewel of our nation. The administrator took over the role of function uh, of both council uh, and uh, the management for an initial period of two years. I've appointed a team of technical and professional specialists in very various fields who are working together with staff, union, students, and the Department of Higher Education and Training to strengthen this university. The first quarterly report on the progress of the turnaround strategy has been submitted to Minister Nzamande. The administrator has specific terms of reference to accomplish during his term at WSU. WSU is a very complex institution with deep structural and systemic historical challenges. Together with my turnaround team, I have over the last five means, uh, months been trying hard to learn and understand the environment within which the turnaround has to be effected. We are pleased to confirm that we have a clear and better understanding of the nature, context, challenges and dynamics of this institution. The understanding experience is of tremendous value in developing a comprehensive turnaround plan 
for this university. Systems and processes to steer the institution back to operational financial efficiency are in place. The financial situation has been stabilized in the short term and salaries and benefits uh, will be paid for 2012. Fruitless and wasteful expenditure is being closely monitored and operational cost cutting exercises have been implemented. We anticipate a break even budget for 2012 if we all work smart. A workable and efficient governance and business process model for the complex multi-campus WSU have been developed and the progress uh, are in process to engage with stakeholders. It's envisaged that the four campuses will have a greater degree of specialization, authority and accountability. The finalization of an appropriate executive managed structure and the population thereof will be now my focus. A forensic audit on staff and their qualifications have been concluded. Further forensic audits on other activities of the institution is underway and will soon be concluded. Aggressive steps to address student governance and student affairs administration have been implemented and the new SRC, SRC constitution is on the verge of being uh, uh, finalized with elections due to take place soon for the first time in two years. Student registration proceeded well in the first term. The university met its uh, student enrollment plan targets. The financial support we received from NISFAS to address the huge financial backlogs and debt of students brought great relief to the heavily indebted students of WSU. On behalf of our students, we are grateful both to the department and NISFAS for this financial injection. A thorough and complete audit was concluded for each and every teaching and learning venue across the university. The results of this have provided the base for assessing the urgent needs in our critical core business, namely teaching, learning and research. A high-level comprehensive turnaround strategy presently being drafted will spell out the sustainable structures and processes for the future. Focus areas are finance, information technology, human resources, the academic projects, student affairs and change management. WSU has already submitted a request for infrastructure and efficiency funding to the Department of Higher Education. By the end of April, the request totals a massive 1.7 billion. This is what we need to bring the university up to standards which all our students and the communities deserve. My approach uh, to the WSU turnaround strategy is a deep and thorough one to ensure long-term sustainability rather than quick fix hasty patching which will not be sustained into the future. My approach is that of a quantum leap in the area of teaching and technology rather than a phased in approach. I think that's enough of what uh, is happening currently. I think why we are here today and I think the Reverend said it here uh, we need to look at what we can celebrate. And I think let's focus on it now. Allow me now to reflect on the strength of this national jewel, Walter Zissouli University. There's a lot of things we can boast about. Don't be mistaken. Let's reflect on a few. Walter Zissouli University has a rich legacy to build upon and thousands of successful graduates already bear testimony of the academic excellence of this university and the legacy institutions. There is much to be proud of at WSU. All the more reason why we must build and strengthen this powerful positioned national education resource to reach her fullest potential. Our program and qualification mix is the envy of many other universities. WSU produces all the scarce skills repeatedly called by government, commerce and industry. We are producing medical doctors, clinical associates, nurses, teachers, engineers, financial accounting office, amongst others, both academic and technology based. What more would you like to boast about? 
Although WSU programs are accredited uh, all the, by the Council for Higher Education and many programs are also fully accredited by the various professional councils. Lately, uh, the research output of WSU has increased since 2009. This university, I don't, want to, I don't believe in a ranking, but we've been somewhere and currently we can boast that this university's research output is no longer amongst the lowest. We've improved tremendously since 2009. The university annually organized research conferences attended by international scholars. Even this year, the university is hosting an international conference uh, during 22nd to 24th of August here in Buffalo City. What more do we want than to boast with research and facilitate research uh, discussions? We have the only medical school in the Eastern Cape and the WSU Faculty of Health Sciences is amongst the top eight medical faculties focusing on problem-based learning in the entire world. The World Organization says, and it's not we are saying it, WSU has set a benchmark for universities across the world. WSU produced the first cohort in South Africa last year of BSc clinical associates, a new breed of healthcare professionals to booth health services in rural areas. Only university in South Africa doing this. WSU offers the only engineering programs in the eastern part of the Eastern Cape. The engineering programs in the areas of civil, electrical, and mechanical are accredited by the Engineering Council of South Africa, EXA, which means that our students can work elsewhere in the world according to the Sydney Accord, the Washington Accord. So, there's a lot to be boast about. I think truly our qualifications, our qualifications you obtain here has transportability into the global village. W is working with the South African Institute of Chartered Accountants, SICA, and the University of Cape Town on a four-year project to become accredited to produce chartered accountants. Again, very unique. 100 first-year students enrolled this year for this program. WSU was awarded South Africa's only research chair in indigenous knowledge systems by the National Department of Science and Technology in conjunction with the National Research Foundation. WSU has the first fully-fledged center for rural development amongst other universities. We have none other year than Professor Luswazi, who have been recognized and appointed recently to work on a high-level um, project in this province and for the country. With these mentioned examples, there's no need to argue further that Walter Sisulu is a massive and powerful resource for the attainment of the better life for all aspired to by our government and our peoples. It was Walter Susulu himself who once said, it's a law of life that problems arise when conditions are there for their solution. I wish to thank the Department of Higher Education and all the WSU communities for their support thus far in this exciting phase of renewal. I appeal to you for your continued partnership as we forge ahead in the future to build the, upon WSU foundations, the kind of university we all deserve to have. Together, we can do this. I'm proud to be part of WSU for the short period of two years, and once again, I offer my full commitment, and with your support and that of the Department of Higher Education, we will achieve the success we seek. Finally, I extend my congratulations to all our graduates. We are proud of what you have achieved and to your families who have supported you. We say, well done, you, your investment will re reap rich rewards. I thank you.
Madam Chancellor, Dr. Brigelia Bam, the Administrator of Walter Sisulu University, Professor Laurent Van Staden, Deputy Vice Chancellor of Planning Quality Assurance and Development, Professor Gina Bays, the Registrar of the University, Professor Town Zamani, 
executive deans here present, other members of the Senior Management Forum, members of the turnaround team of the administrator, our honorable guest speaker, honorable Lucinda C. Jonas, MEC for Economic Development, Environmental Affairs, and Tourism in the province, our officiating priest, Pastor John Amor, dignitaries here present from government, business, and other sectors, members of Senate of the University, the Institutional Forum, President of Convocation, Dr. Sianda Makaula, staff of the university, parents and guardians, our honorable graduates, students, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. Madam Chancellor, I'm here to introduce the guest speaker, um, Honorable Nsemdisi Jonas, a distinguished ANC chieftain, a shrewd politician, strategist, leader and custodian of economic development, environmental affairs and tourism in the province. Born in Utenegh in the Eastern Cape, and St. Jonas matriculated at Newell High School in Port Elizabeth. He has been an activist all his life, having been first arrested as a 14-year-old for leading political activities in the Port Elizabeth area. His appetite in politics was further sharpened by the Black Consciousness Movement in the early 80s. Msundisi was instrumental in the operations of Asaso, including launching underground structures in the Eastern Cape and beyond. He was also a key member in the establishment of the UDF structures in the Eastern Cape, escaping the heat squads many times. We really have to applaud you for escaping the heat squad several times. <laughs> During the turbulent times of the 80s, he obtained a Bachelor of Arts in History and Sociology at Vista University and later a higher diploma in education at Rhodes University. As a result of his outstanding capability of developing strategies and leading risky operations, he was sent on exile to complete military training in Angola and Uganda for the People's Army Koto Wesiswe. Upon his return in the 90s, Mr. Jonas played a key role in establishing the structures of the ANC and the SACP in the Eastern Cape. He has been a member of the ANC Provincial Executive Council for two terms. The ANC, recognizing his skills, deployed him to work on the important task of establishing the new provincial administration in the Eastern Cape in 1994 after the democratic elections. Sir Jonas has held many strategic positions in the Eastern Cape government and they are as inter alia. 2000 to 2005 was Chief Executive Officer, Eastern Cape Development Corporation, tasked with the amalgamation of the then Transkai Development Corporation, Sea Sky Development Corporation, Sea Sky People's Bank, and other smaller development institutions. Between 1999 and 2000, he was Chief Executive Officer, Center for the Investment, uh, Center for Investment Marketing of the Eastern Cape. And between 1997 and 1999, he was also Chief Executive, uh, Executive Officer of the Socioeconomic Consultative Council. He served as General Manager of Affairs Complan tax with uh, providing capacity and support for development planning in the Eastern Cape. He was chair of the Portfolio Committee for Human Settlement 
between 2007 and 2009. Member of the Executive Council responsible for finance from 2009 to 2010. So also a member of the Executive Council responsible for economic development, environmental affairs, and tourism from 2009 to date. Other career highlights include working for Kakiso Trust in Port Elizabeth as a researcher involved in assessing and redesigning community projects and programs for possible funding. Employed as an Eastern Cape Provincial Coordinator by the Saki Trust in East London, taking an instrumental role in setting up a number of forums that dealt with challenges faced by education, educational institutions and learners, and providing planning and strategic capacity to the ANC and establishing both the IDZ and the EDLIS. He has also undertaken additional training and courses in marketing at the University of Cape Town, investment and trade promotion at the Island Development Agency and the Singapore Development Agency, management investment and trade programs at the Malaysian Development Agency, amongst others. Madam Chancellor, I therefore have the honor and privilege to introduce this illustrious son of the province, a distinguished politician and leader, to present his guest lecture. Thank you. The Chancellor of Walter Sicilio University, Dr. Brigalia Bam, the Administrator, Professor Van Staden, Senior Management and Staff the University, President of Convocation, Dr. Makaula, invited guests and dignitaries, parents and graduates. It is an honor and pleasure to be invited to address this graduation ceremony. I must say I'm humbled to stand before a gathering of African intellectuals who embody not just the present, but the future of our province and our country. You, the graduates here today, are walking in the footsteps of some of Africa's greatest intellectuals, men and women who have shaped our province and our country, and indeed our continent. You have earned the right to walk proudly in those footsteps, but I urge you to walk beyond where those footprints ended, to use your knowledge, your education, your skills, to walk new paths, to leave new footprints, and your own legacy. Today, I would like to take the opportunity to sketch a picture of how you, the graduates, and indeed African intellectuals, fit into the bigger canvas of the Eastern Cape development. I will do this by stress, tracing the link between education and development at three points in time, namely the late 1900s, the 19th century, sorry, the late 19th century, the mid 20th century, and the early 21st century. I will refer to these three epochs as life, existence, and rebirth. Can I begin with the first one? The Eastern Cape has made a disproportionate, a disproportionate contribution to the modern South African state. Traditionally, the telling of this contribution has focused on the frontier wars of the 1800s and the so-called civilization and modernization of Africans by settlers. This perspective gradually corrected over the last 18 years, ignored the fact that Africans were not passive recipients of change. <coughs> Rather, early African thinkers, like Jabavu, Nsikane, Soga, Khubusana, and Kai, played a key role in shaping South African modernity. modernity. They and their peers, many educated here in the Eastern Cape, 
contributed their thoughts and intellect to important change in using fields such as literature, religion, medicine, politics, and journalism. We owe much to this proud African intellectual heritage. Having experienced the immense power at the command of the industrialized nations of Europe during the hundred years of war from the late 18th century onwards, African communities had come to realize that it was only by acquiring these same skills and knowledge that the Africans could hope to compete on equal basis with those who had conquered and dispossessed of their land. The establishment of the Native Education Association under the leadership of Reverend Elijah Makiwane in the in 1880s closely parallels that of the first modern political body in Bumba Yamanyama among African voters of the Eastern Cape in 1882. These developments were supplemented by the emergence of a secular African language press, languages press in the shape of Imvo Zabansundu in 1884. Kosa intellectuals, including Ngoba, Kyamzashe, Duane, Mzimba, Makiwane, Wachube, Chabavu, Kubusana, and Bokwe, were at the forefront of the spread of knowledge and intellectual ne networking at this time. Their efforts were complemented and facilitated by the proliferation of missionary and community schools, some of which were built on the initiative of African educators like Lang John Langalibale Ledube and Charlotte McClake. These schools became the incubators of the first generations of Africans endowed with modern education. British imperialism in the Eastern Cape unintentionally provided us with the tools for our own liberation. Although European missionaries were undoubtedly complicit with British imperialism in oppressing black people, by providing Africans with modern education, the missionaries facilitated our independent understanding of modernity and laid the foundation of modern nationalist liberation struggle against opp oppression. The missionary educations, educational institutions continued to be necessary for activists in the fields of politics and education well into the 20th century, when the intervention of Hendrik van Voelt and his accolades put an end to this. This leads me to the second phase, epoch. Fervut apartheid set about systematically to disassemble, to disassembling the developmental gain achieved by Africans through education. Having actively participated in, the, in shaping the development of the Cape Colony and the country, African intellectuals were summarily silenced. Higher education became the almost exclusive preserve of whites, effectively limiting the institutional base from which black intellectual work could be developed. Where avenues to higher education remains open, this led to inferior institutions allowed to offer only limited types of education. Access to university was further obstructed by apartheid-created socioeconomic circumstances. Not only did most black families not have access to the scholarships that made higher education affordable to their white counterparts, but potential black students were often forced to seek employment at the expense of education to ensure their family survivals. The elusiveness of higher education was entrenched by the system of inferior basic education, designed expressly, I quote, to keep the native in his place. Bandu education, as it was known, was achieved through such strategies as very high people-teacher ratio, curriculum control, and deliberately inadequate, inadequate resourcing, resource provision. Under apartheid, black, black South Africans were expected to merely exist, but again, the streams of education and development coalesced. Your parents will remember how our schools exploded when the weight of apartheid became unbearable. The Soweto uprising of 1976 marked the moment when we vociferously demanded our dignity, an end to the use of education as a weapon of oppression. Black schooling became the target of concerted attack and the site of sustained struggle. Reflecting on these times, 
it is clear that with so many of us devoting our lives to achieving freedom, even going into exile or underground, we lost momentum in terms of development. Apartheid effectively diverted many black South Africans. We consequently all but lost at least two entire generations.